You are now tuning to the Father's Matter 2 podcast, where we discuss family, careers, community, health, and all the other stuff you just might not talk about in the barbershop. Sponsored by Port Royal Patties and Father Figure Children and Family Services with your host, David Mullins. Fathers Matter 2. Right, so we say welcome to the Fathers Matter 2 podcast and we say a massive good afternoon to our special guest today, Mr. Martin Griffith. Good how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm well, thank you for um, coming down to my kitchen today and um, joining us for this podcast. Martin, if you are unaware for those listening and those watching, is uh, a leading vascular and trauma surgeon um, over at Bart's. Is it Bart's Trust? Bart's Health and NHS Trust, yeah. And um, as well as that, he's a university lecturer and also an ambassador for the Mary Seacole Trust. Trust as well. Yeah, and like yourself, a member of the VCP, VCP which we'll speak a bit more about later on. Absolutely. Of course. I'm um, going to say thank you to our sponsors, uh, Port Royal Patties. Um, do check them out, and um, yes, as as we were just discussing, they even do a vegan patty too, whatever that is. We'll work on that. <laughs> so, for all our vegan friends, you yeah. can get yourself a vegan patty. Um, all welcome from, from Port Royal, as long as as well as the um, jerk chicken and the beef, of course. Yeah. And also, we say thank you to uh, Father Figure Children and Family Services as well. Um, so, we are gonna get straight into it. We've got a lot to talk about. And we are going to go, we're going to start with um, yourself and your growing up okay. and, and what that looks like. So where were you born, Martin? Um, and tell us about where you were born, yeah. where you were brought up and, and who was in your family, your immediate family, siblings, okay. etc. Cool. Right. So I was born in Lewisham. Lewisham, okay. South East London, mm-hmm. uh, 65. Um, me and my little sister and my mum. Okay. And my dad was sort of inconsistent, in intermediate, sort of intermittent sort of presence in my life. Mm. Um, we grew up in social housing in Deptford, Brockley, Lewisham Way, and I went to local schools, and me and my mum and my sister worked it out, you know. Yeah. So it was, um, yeah, it is. So tell me, you you, you say, um, you were, is, was your mum uh, born here, or? No, mum came over uh, about six, seven years before I was born. From? From, from Kingston, Jamaica. Okay. Uh-huh. And new dad, um, they, they, they got together here. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, here I, here, there I was. Um, they, 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 never, they never fully got together, so that never, that never sort of happened out. And um, me, my mum and then my, and my little sister grew up initially in Deptford. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we moved to um, Broccoli. As I got to that, I got primary school age. Right. So... I'm going to focus a bit more on dad. Yeah. So you say dad was in and out, they were yeah, about, yeah. what, 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 what well, did that was, look that like? Was, that was a red man. Okay. Right. And he lived the life and you know, he did what red man did. He's a time, man of his time. Mm. God rest him. Yeah. All right. First thing to say about my dad, I don't bear him any manners. Okay. He mm. was exactly what he was. Okay. Yeah. And he came, he came to England from the Caribbean with a mindset and lifestyle choice. And he lived his life. Mm-hmm. Him and my mum were very, very close. Yeah. And they were in close. They were close throughout my entire life. And they married way, way late in the day. Right. And they went back to Jamaica together. And he died back here or he got here um, about four or five years ago. Okay. But um, as, a, as a traditional parent, well, he, he was more like a traditional Caribbean parent in some regards. And that he was in and out of the house, in and out of my life. And I'd see him periodically mm-hmm. in my life. I think from his point of view, he'd best buy it. But he was. Inconsistent. Yeah. So I'd see him week to week. He would pop in and pop out. Mm. He was very much about the superficial. So he would do things. Yes. And he'd give me stuff. Yes. And I would be there. Would be product. But there would not be substance behind it. Right. And I think that um, though he was a man of great charisma. Yes. All right. And charm. And very popular. Mm. He never really did the things that I was. I was sort of keyed into. So there was no sort of career. Sort of like aspiration with delivery to a bit more than his potential be merited. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and 
was he good enough at the time? Did you feel that he was good enough at the time? At the or time, did... I thought he was all right. I thought it was because he was yeah. a hero. I said, all my friends wanted to know my dad. He, right. was, he was the man. He was out on the road doing stuff, and everybody knew he was. He was running shows and dances and stuff. He was, you know, he was the, he was the man to know. Yes. And all my friends viewed him as a father. Right. Much more than myself. Mm. But because I wasn't the, I wasn't the what, running around doing stuff. I was, I was the, I was the boring trundler at school yeah. doing stuff mm. doing stuff that wasn't really into him it didn't resonate with him so my achievement was quite important I think right so in in my extreme youth I was very 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 proud of him but as mm. time went by yeah. you know you know when you get older you start thinking about look at your parents and what they do with their lives mm. I could see that my that my mum was working three jobs mm. putting two kids through school getting up early morning cleaning working coming back putting food on the table going working out going to bed, he was in and out, and there was never anything coming back. And in terms of like, you know, what he was interested in, what he was aspiring to, to never really met my, my aspirations. Right. So as I got older, yeah, I recognised at that point in time, there was some point in my life, it must have been the point where I realised that he wasn't the man I wanted to be. Right. What he was doing wasn't what I was, what I was interested in. Mm. But, it, but it played really well, a lot of kids I grew up with. Yeah. And when you, when you passed at his funeral, every man was there. Yeah, yeah. And everyone, everyone remembered your dad. All giving love to my dad. Yeah. Right. It's quite a bit, it felt a bit weird. Yeah, yeah, I understand. So in terms of, so how, your mum seems like she was very, obviously, a really good woman in terms of... Yeah, I better say that. <laughs> I'd be in trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In terms of what she obviously would have done. What kind of child were you, though? Was, did you... um? Did your the lack of influence of your dad did that did that did that mean that you were a, a, a difficult child in any part or way or, or so it didn't really or, or was mum on, on the ball or was it just not in your nature? I'm told I'm yeah. told I was a, I was a good child but I was too cheeky. Okay. Not so I was I was very respectful mm -hmm. and you know sister background lots of licks looking <laughs> out of place you know and if it was if it was a problem. She would call him, and I would get I would get him in the lash. As right. as that, so I didn't push buttons too. So you far. wasn't you wasn't really one who pushed also too far. Bound, boundaries. My sister pushed boundaries, but I was not the one. I was there to carry the weight, and I felt mm. it was my job to carry the weight. Yes. in the house, so I would be responsible. Yeah, I would I would do. Mum said to me, "School matters. Mm. Stuff matters. Doing this stuff matters. Be who you are matters." So I would do this stuff. Yeah, and I would I would go to church. I would go I would go to the scouts. I'd do my stuff. I would do what I was told. You told the line, basically. But, but at school, I was a clown. So at home, no pushback whatsoever. The little girl knew what she wanted to do, but at school, I was a fool. Because I could get away with it. Yeah. And um, and, and, and were you, a, would you, was you was you an academic at school, would you say? Would you, would you always quite, did you, did you find it easy? Bookish. Yeah, I didn't find, I didn't find school stuff very difficult, very challenging. It was just, it was boring more than anything else. That's why right. I played around so much. Mm. And I, was, I, got a, I got a label as a youngster for being difficult. Right. And I know in, in my secondary education, there were, there were some issues around me being a challenging personality in class, because mm -hmm. I would talk back. Right. And push back on stuff, because I read. Because mm -hmm. I would go to the library and read books. And they would say stuff about this. I said, no, that's not true, actually. I've read this. That's not correct. And I'd bring out the book and show it in class. <laughs> it would cause consternation. But actually, you know, it was, it was, I think it was important because I didn't, I always felt there was more to know. Yeah. And my mum was, was really passionate about me reading, about me learning more about myself. Because stuff wasn't taught at school about mm. black people. Yes. In a certain way. Right. And I heard all these fantastic stories from my, from my family about the Caribbean mm. and about, about, Africa, and when I went to the Caribbean, I went to the places, I saw these amazing things, but it wasn't necessarily in the school curriculum. So I wanted to find out more. Yeah. So I became quite bookish. What time did you, did you, you went, when, when did you go to the Caribbean? How old was you when you first? first? Went back, I was about 10, 11. Same as me. I was about, I had my 11th birthday in Jamaica. Oh no, my 12th birthday in Jamaica. Yeah. yeah. I think mum took me out for the first, she hadn't been out for a long, long time. Right. And took out, took out the kids to show off to, you know, to her children, mm. to, her, to her parents. And um, I think it was a big deal for her because I was because I was I was doing the thing that my my that my grandfather was interested in. So I was academic and I was respectful and I was doing the right thing. So, so I came and did my homework. Lots of love for that. Mm. Ate all the food. I like my, my American cousins, so that was all good. Yeah. Played football with the kids. Lived my life. 
went to the beach. It was all good. Mm. So I went to there. I went there most summers for the next, you know, till I was 18, 19, 20. Oh, so you done literally every summer you went out? Well, every time we could afford it, yeah. yeah. Mum, mum was working for BA at the time with yeah. cheap flights. Right. So okay. we not, we were, there was no money around, but, but you so could cheap. It, yeah, you could so go, cheap, quite easily. go out quite easily. So it made, oh, made that thing, that was a really big deal. Yes. And because we wrote, so I wrote to my grandparents every week. Mm. That's part of the ritual. Oh, Sunday, okay. I would write to my grandparents. So you had a very close relationship then. Well, I wrote, yeah, and they wrote back. Yeah, you know, because yeah. that was that's how we communicated. Right, and you know, I was I was because um, my my I wrote my grandfather remotely parroting me in lots of ways because he was a real man of substance, mm. painter, decorator, kickstarter, not you know, not fabulously wealthy, but very yeah. principled, very self-contained, very honourable, and he would write to me about stuff that he thought was important. He would say, "Your schoolwork is important." Your life is important. Mm. What you do makes me proud. Yeah. So, so going, so going through school, you were, there was never really a time for you where you was off the ball. Uh, six form. Six form. Six form. Right. So, G. So O levels for you. Yeah. yeah. O levels Go went on. went fine for you. Yeah, they were fine. I mean, yeah, you yeah, did a few early sell through. Yeah. And then looking at where I'm going to go for sixth form, and I didn't get into it. But it's important to go back a little bit. So, yes. So primary school. Yeah. Right, also did work at school. Do the what they call 11 plus, whatever it is now, did really, really well, looking at schools, okay, and I couldn't get in anywhere. Couldn't, I, best grades, couldn't get in anywhere. What was that about, do you think? I don't know, don't know what that's about. Lots of ta- it was a time when things went from grammar to comprehensive, so I, I, I didn't tick the right boxes, I went to lots of interviews at places at some really good schools, didn't get in, got a scholarship to a good school, but couldn't afford the fees. Mm. Uh, but even if it was 10% fees, it still was too much money for my yeah, mum. Yeah. Mum was, was on tight money, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that didn't happen. So, my credit my primary school teacher for this, Basil Morgan, who sadly passed, he said to my mum, go to the school that I went to. It's not a great school, but the teachers there pick up talent, they look after him for you. So he recommended you to go to the actual school, your mum, to send you to the school that he actually went to? Yes, absolutely. Which was? What do you remember, Comprehensive, now closed. Yeah. That's there. That's a Forest Hill, um, which was, for me, a little bit of a trip. You know, halfway on the bus, but um, and I thought I wasn't really, I wasn't really, I was, un, un, I, I felt a bit of disappointment, at me not getting into school, and, yeah. and, and being, having not felt anything, yeah. not being a success was quite surprising. Mm. And then went to, went to school, and that was fine. I cruised through everything. It wasn't any real pressure. It was a very unruly place. It was a rough school. Mm. There was some lots of crazy stuff happening <laughs> in the class. <laughs> but but really, you no. Know, but a good grounding, you know, and, 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 te- and, and true to his word, the teachers there picked up on me and they supported me massively. Okay. So they gave me extra stuff to do and fed back on me, gave me books to read. I thought that was getting a lot out of it. Mm. So d- did you know what you wanted to be when you was at school? Like, in terms of the career you're in now, no. was that what you wanted? What no. did you want it, when you were, when, when you were in school, stroke college, what were you aiming, what was you heading for? I was going to be an aircraft mechanic. Okay. Join the RAF. And was that, Anything to do with the fact that your mum was um, uh, working for BA? Was that that wasn't any influence? You didn't. It wasn't enough to do with that. Mum worked in the canteen at BA. <laughs> mum didn't fly any planes. Right. System. It was just one of those things. Um, now I wanted something that meant I could fix stuff. All right. I gave responsibility. I looked at Star Trek. I thought about Scotty. Like that. Mm-hmm. My aspiration was to fix a thing, not to not to, not to capture it. Yeah. Just to be the guy who fixed stuff. So I could see that as a realistic aim in my life. I could do that, I could fix planes, I could do that kind of stuff. So I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll join the RAF, become an aircraft mechanic, and do that sort of stuff, and that'll get my life sorted out. I thought, brilliant, that's gonna be really good. Yeah. A-levels came by, so I was too good. Mum said, you ain't getting to school now. You're gonna stick it out, do A-levels. I thought, what's all this about? I've got my life planned sorted out. Been, been, been on a career so you wanted to move into the RAF? I was out, I was out at 16, joined the military, yeah. get my career, get out of Lewisham, <laughs> get in the plane, do my stuff, and, and I'd be good. But it didn't play out that way, you know, and then um, mum to persevere, see what happens. But even then, I was still gonna go, oh, what I'll do is I'll do my thing at six four, no, that's a flunk out, go join the 18. And that was still the plan, it wasn't until I was at sixth form who said, well, have you thought about any other careers? And I thought, not really. I thought I'm going to do computing. I used that to get into the military. Mm. And again, I wouldn't You determined to go into the military? I was determined to do something um, more practical. No, I didn't think, I didn't really, never, never really crossed my mind but anything more than going towards some sort of vocational thing with the military. I wanted the structure. Yeah. I saw friends who joined the Marines and stuff. And had come back from being raggedy ass little fools to turn up and being they were grown yeah, men who yeah. looked 
strong, people were proud of. And they had the uniform, man. Mm. You know? And I thought to myself, this guy's changed his life around. I can't be a policeman, that would be crazy. <laughs> Right, I, I can't play sport. Yeah, right? I I can't sing. So what can I do in my life to get me get me some respect? Mm. That's what I want to do and get me where I want to be. Yeah, to me, which made sense to me. And that sounds crazy, but it made a lot of sense to me at the time. Mm. And it wasn't until I was at sixth form people started saying to me, "Have you thought about something more than that? Like going to university? Yeah, university commuting. I do computing. What about going to Oxford? No, I'm not going there. It's too far. Or about going medical school to the mall? What are you talking about? Because because mum was a healthcare assistant, what they call healthcare assistants now. Working at King's at the time, working in clinic. And I saw doctors, they were like big, old, white men right. doing stuff in big suits. Mm. That's not me. Yeah. That's not my life. You know, I don't want to do that. Um, but I said, well, look, just, just apply, see what happens. And I thought, no, I'll do it, I'll fail, I'll go into medical, I'll go into clear and do computers and then I can go down the RAS. So I said, well, the plan hadn't changed. Yeah, yeah. And I sort of, I thought of, I sort of fell into applications and I did it more to, more to humour my mum yeah. and my teachers. So I applied to the medical school with the shortest prospectus. It's at the start. So it was round the corner, okay, and it had a really, really short, it was like two bits of A4. I thought, brilliant, I can, get, I can, I can read this. Yeah, yeah. All these pages and pages of stuff and visits and no, 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 no. It wasn't anything to do with that. And I think, you know, I don't quite, and I, and I applied thinking nothing would happen. Now, what I hadn't really appreciated is that I'd been doing quite a lot of stuff on my own on side of school, I've been doing a lot of martial arts, I've played a lot of rugby. Mm-hmm. Things that I just got into because I, I was looking for structure. Yeah. I'm unwittingly looking for structure. I was looking for mentorship somewhere along the line. Mm. So I play a lot of sport. Yeah. And I do things that were gave me that, that were organised, that had given me some discipline. Mm-hmm. And I found those things at faith, found those things in sport, found those things in martial arts. And there were there were lots of men there who were responsible for teaching stuff. Yeah, that I was getting I was getting guidance from and support, which kept me, I suppose, regulated, mm-hmm. modulated. I suppose you know because I was I was a, I was inside. I was quite my head was swimming mm. about stuff. I didn't know really, what, what masculinity was about, what life was about. Mm. Growing up in South London, when there was it was turmoil, as I say. So I didn't really know where things were going, and I I was probably I was just looking for somebody to help guide me along. And that's the one that wasn't, wasn't really coming from home. Mum was being brilliant. Yeah. I didn't really appreciate it at the time. I was ungrateful, like most children are. Yeah. Age. Yeah. I was looking for someone to give me a little bit more. So I applied to medical school and madly enough got in. I couldn't believe it. So you've got into medical school, not really expecting to. No, not at all. And not necessarily even really knowing that you want to do anything in the medical field. Not at all. And then what? That's like, you just like, <laughs> I, the, the, it's, the, it's like landing on the moon. Mm. Right? It was just a different planet altogether. Mm. Right? I went to I went to a sixth form college. Um, third to half of kids there were from Africa and the other backgrounds. All of them were you know, we were equally poor. Go to Barts. Right? Barts is a Division One Premier League medical school. One hundred and ten people in the club in a year. Right? It's based in Chai House Square in Central London, right by the Barbican. Okay. They take the cream of the prop, all right? And I go to medical school, 100 people, okay? I'm the only black person in that class, all right? And the last West Indian person, the last Jamaican through that place was Arthur Wint. Arthur Wint won an Olympic gold medal in 1948, all right? Are you kidding me? So the last person, the last Jamaican who studied where you were studying was an Olympic gold medalist for the Second World War, became Jamaican High Commissioner, um, you know, fighter, pilot, Olympic gold medalist, Bart's hero. No pressure then. No pressure. And the guys, and there were guys who'd been there from Caribbean, etc. They'd been there and they were nice stuff. They'd been there in, they'd been there in, they'd been there There was nobody be around there. There were a couple of Asian kids. This is way back now. This is, this is, this is, you know, this is 80s time. Yeah. Right? Um, and um, no, the vast majority of people in public school entrance, okay, but all of them, all of them, white, majority of them are male, and I didn't fit in. And it was like landing on the moon. So I was like, what happened? What's this all about? <laughs> it was really funny. So the first day or two, it's just like just walking around. Just, like, just trying to find your feet. What is going on here? Where am I? <laughs> what is this like? Mum dropped me off and mum dropped me in the car. I've got a bag of broken biscuits right? and my snacks. <laughs> right? I thought I'd do it all right. Yeah. I didn't realise I was poor. Until you but landed there. So he's driving around in their own cars. <laughs> and two guys in their own car. What's all that about? You know, in cars nicer than my dad's. Um, and I was eating things like processed cheese and broken biscuits, 
and they're going around and, they're, and, they, and they've got accounts at supermarkets and getting stuff as they see fit and they're paying, paying, paying credit cards. I thought, gosh, this is a different world for me. Wow. And um, so it's really funny. So people try to push me around and I thought, well, that's easy. I can do with that. That's a physical test. They're all just soft. And it was difficult for me mm. initially. I really struggled with the people and the academics. So it wasn't, and I, I struggled a lot. And I think I had no, I had no, social, no social status at all initially. So I was completely outside that. But I was saved by playing rugby, weirdly enough. I played rugby at a decent level at, at school. And um, <clears throat> what happened at the medical school I played, they had a veterans team, which was basically graduates in their 20s and 30s who played on the Saturday. And I played for the, for the little team. And I was asked to pick, they, every so often they pick up they pick a young kid, they pick if they come and play enough for yeah, yeah. like. They think that was like a pet, you know, for a joke. And um, we played we playing grown men. And I'm 18 years old, right? And in the middle of the game, rugby, and someone gets punchy. And I don't remember what happened myself personally, but apparently, I, apparently from the such slide, they saw this black hand pull this guy into a rug. And I just wailed on him, right? And he was down, lying on the ground, unconscious. <laughs> and after that, I was good. It was all good. Everyone was your mate. I was my mate, yeah, it was fine. Because I was dangerous, all right? And I could tick a few boxes, I was black and I was dangerous, I was dancing, I was dancing. it was all good. And I spent two years in medical school, struggling really hard just to fit in. Ran in my weight balloon, played a lot of sport, wasn't very happy. And like two years of not being happy, I decided to leave. Took a year off. And I was, I was about to leave medical school and give up and go, and go back to the military. Right. And the, the, the dean said to me, look, no, don't do that. Just take some time away from the course and try and refine your feet mm. and just go and do what you need to do. So I went off um, and I said to mum, look, I'm leaving. Mum lost her mind. Because a golden boy with me was, was a failure, yeah, and you're yeah. going to give up medical school and go back back in the ghetto. And she's like, "What's happened? What have I done wrong?" I said, yeah. no, "That's all right. I'm taking the time away." Said, what? Mm, we, our parents don't understand that. Understand not not taking a year off gap, college. Gap year, gap, gap what? Year. <laughs> gap in your head. <laughs> she said, "You're really at home and get a job." I said, "Like I've been back an hour to get a job. Got six weeks to get a job." So I was scrapping around looking for work. Nothing, 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 nothing. And I applied to an advertisement in the Times to work at Foils a bookshop. Right. And we enough got, I got into. I got a job working in foils as a bookseller. I worked there for about four or five months working in an art department. Met Christina Foil. She's the um, the, 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 the the then owner. Igor Stimak. Stimak. Yeah. Um, I got a job selling art books. Art books and um, in the gallery selling books about art and craft, art history, home decorating, that kind of stuff. Completely out of place. Quite a job. Yeah, you know, shirt tie job, nice, doing some handwritten bills, very old fashioned company, lots of, lots of, lots of recent graduates are working there, mm. and fun, and money. So the four months, save some money, just mum want to go away for a bit, she went, what, what are you going to go now? So I want to take some time in your country, so what's this about? They want to go away now, you're going back to Caribbean, you know, yeah. we want to go, I think we'll go to India, so what? <laughs> I'm going, oh, I want to do the thing that everybody else does, go to South East Asia, and go, what's the thing, 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 so whatever, I said, I said, I said okay, I said, I want to do this, like, I want to do it, like, I've got a ticket, I've got money, I've got a railroad ticket, I'm going. Yeah. I said, I want to do money, I'll get a job. She looked at me, and she looked at me up and down, and she thought to herself, right, okay, just give me 400 quid, to take it. And that's a lot of money, mm. to go. So I went off, I went to India, I went to Thailand, I went to Malaysia, to Singapore, worked in Australia for a bit, mm. I was in Hawaii, and kind of weird place, I came back six months later, Having done all this stuff and worked in kind of weird jobs and scratched around, feeling a lot better about myself and more myself. Yeah. Came back to medical school. So I agreed to give it a trial back, came back, and I realised what, what I was looking at. I was looking at a lot of overprivileged children who were under talented, who'd been hothoused through with the medical school. And actually, I wasn't stupid. Mm. I wasn't lazy. I just, I just hadn't understood it. Yeah. And from then on, medical school was brilliant. How old were you when that? I was 18, 19, so third year, so I left. I left 1921. Yeah, took a year off, came yeah. back, and then did the last four years, did a BSc, extra year to take a BSc, graduated. And don't get me wrong, I had a, don't, I wasn't never a good student. I never worked that hard. All the clowning I was talking about played out massively in medical school. Yeah, but I fitted in there because I was the I was the outlying inlier. So I was I was safely dangerous. Mm. Okay, but I the exams were okay. Um, uh, socially, I was very strong then. Um, I read. I made some brilliant friends who knew me. Then the friends I made, I made at seventeen. Yeah, stayed. 
still now, yeah. to, this, to this day, to yeah. this week, till tomorrow, I'm going they, out with them tomorrow. They know you. Yeah. They know me. They didn't even know I was an idiot. Yeah. Right. In my, in my Puma and my Sergio Tashini. <laughs> right. They knew me for a minute. And they still, they still, they still really piss out of me now. Yeah. Because they, they're, they're my old friends and they're, and they're good guys. Yeah. I love them. I love them, my brothers. Um, but I got to middle school, and, and I don't quite understand how it happened because I went from being a duffer to being an honours graduate. The middle school, so I graduated from honours, great, brilliant. Don't know how that is, you know. Had a BSc, went to career in medicine, and off we went. So medical school was an incredibly interesting time for me. Mm. It was I was completely out of my element. Yeah. And isolated socially, emotionally, physically from where it was. But I learned a lot about myself. I learned I could take myself out of a problem. And um, if I if I worked on it, I could work on myself and come back. And more often than not, the problem was not about me, about my integration with the situation. Yeah. So I thought that I found it really really useful. Yeah. And off it went. So so the tra- the travelling seems to have played a really strong part in you the becoming of you this person that 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 decides that this is what I'm going to do is the path I'm going to take. I think, you know, you take yourself away from bad influences, okay? A lot of yeah. negative influences, all the stuff you, all the stuff you, you believe you should hear about yourself. Mm. And just do practical things. Yeah. Get a job. Earn some money. Yeah. Do some stuff. Wash your own clothes. Yeah. Live your own life. you no one there really help. Help yourself. Mm. What are you going to do? Get What are you going to eat today? What are you going to do today? What are you going to do with your day today? Where are you going to be tomorrow? Yeah. And it was really useful because I, I actually had to cook food for other people. Yeah. As well as myself yeah. and support other people. I, mm. I never thought I had that in me. Yes. To support other people. So yeah. I, I was looking after people who were upset and then out of nowhere. And I said, let me just sort that out. I could do some food, you know, do some work together, do that. And I became much more confident about myself. Yeah. Because I was struggling with self confidence. I still do at this point, worrying right. about insecurities and self confidence mm. and about being good enough to do what I do. Yeah. So it was useful to actually deliver something like that. And I think like a lot of people um, who were insecure, I, I can get reference points on what I achieve externally. So what I do for a living, yeah. where I sit, what I do, who I represent, makes me feel that I'm worthy of what I do. Mm. And I think that that really helped. Yeah. I came back to that. And I think once once things are going in my direction, I became confident in that. I became comfortable in that in that situation. And I really enjoyed mm. that period. And although I although, don't get me wrong, it had its ups and downs. Yeah. You, know, you can't go to that kind of traditional environment and not encounter. Traditional attitudes. I don't regret going there. Yeah. I don't regret people I've made. I, don't, I, I, I definitely, definitely am so grateful for friends I've made who are amazing. Yeah. And uh, self confidence I've got out of that. And that's why I stayed in that environment. Great. All right. We're speaking to Martin Griffith, um, vascular trauma surgeon. We are going to pop off for a break. We'll be back on the other side. We'll hear a bit more about um, you being a family man mm-hmm. and um, a bit more about your career as well on the other side. Back in two sex. Meet Sean. He's been unfairly denied access to his daughter. Sean really doesn't know what to do. Eventually, Sean contacts family lawyers who say they can help, but it will cost £200 per hour. Sean really can't afford these rates, and he's back to square one. Sitting in his car, Sean switches on the radio and hears an advert for an organization who provide unique specialist support for fathers that find themselves in this exact situation and for a fraction of the price he was quoted. Sean uses his phone and goes straight online and books himself a free consultation at www.fatherfigure.org.uk. Father Figure supported Sean with all his paperwork. They accompanied him to court and even negotiated with the respondent and their solicitors. Nine months later, Sean is a much happier man as he and his daughter have been reunited why don't you do what Sean did and book a free consultation now at www.fatherfigure.org.uk. It might just change your life. Right, so we're back here with uh, Martin Griffith um, and we have been speaking all about your upbringing and yeah. things like that, how you got into your field of work. Um, let's talk about you, the father. Yep. Family man, you married man? I'm married man. How long have you been married? Married about six years now. Oh, I think that's the same as me. Snap. Yeah. Snap. Um, and children? Tell me about children. Cause... So, so this is a good. This is a good question. So, yeah. So I've got two boys. Two boys. Um, uh, who we adopted. Um, okay. Um, six, six, and years ago, a year ago. 
uh, two lovely boys um, who um, were with us and I actually completely transformed my life and transformed our relationship mm-hmm. and made me a better person yeah. and, 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 and a, a better doctor as well. Weird to say. Mm. How old did you? How old? What's what age? So, so um, the uh, the oldest is nine, the youngest is four. Mm-hmm. Both doctors, doctors about the age of three years old. Um, uh, uh, both dual heritage, um, and um, both had challenging histories beforehand. Mm. And um, but hugely loving little boys. Yeah, who needed proper love and parenting. Yeah, you know, and it's, and seeing the transformation in both of them. Over the years of growing with us has been really, really rewarding and very, you know, very humbling. So, so tell me about your parenting skills, and in terms of, so I'm putting, I put you on the spot. I'm um, on this one. What, what's something you'd say with regards to your parenting that you have maintained from your own upbringing that you still? carry over to I know it's a bit of a tricky one yeah? <laughs> well you still carried over to what you do now as a far, as a parent and 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 where might that would, yeah I'll, I'll ask you the second part after that something so, that you, you've probably kept so I kept I kept a lot of structure and a lot of actually um, forgiveness mm. I'm by nature an angry man mm-hmm. I'm by nature a sort of person who reacts to stuff yeah but I remember when I mucked up, I mucked up royally all the way through my childhood. My mum was disciplining me. Yes. At the end of the day, I'll always be forgiven. Yeah. And tomorrow's always another day. And I think that's so important, you know, like as a parent, I think I've learned from that as well. Um, that it's important that you give your children that opportunity that you forgive them. Like they're your children. Yeah. And you've got to give them a chance to, to go yeah. again. And you can't bear resentment. You can't bear resentment. I mean, I think, I think you know, I, I, there's, because I think you know, children need love. That's great. It's easy to say. Yeah. When it's all going downhill. It's great. It's lovely. Brilliant. It's all your day. You're yeah. well, the kids are nice. It's lovely. But when they've been bad, mm. when they've been irrationally bad or kicked off or something, yeah. you've got to you got to pick them up. Yeah. Let them understand that. Yeah, it's been a bad day yeah. or a bad week. And bad I guess hour. you've got to have that point of okay, this is the peak of you being told off or whatever your punishment is. But yeah. actually, there's a comeback. We can go again. Uh, you can, you can we get it, to go again. Make sure angry. Yeah, they they trash your property. They, yeah. you know, they embarrass them to themselves or you in front of people, and, you, and that that plays badly with me. Yeah, plays badly with my mum and dad. Would not take it very well. Yeah, social embarrassment. Oh, <laughs> no, no, status. status. That might be a cultural thing, isn't it? I think it probably is. Yeah. Status is a big thing to, big mm. thing to me, and when they do do that, yeah, I mean, they're just running around like fools. Like, That's fine. My boy ain't doing that. Yeah, in front of my. <laughs> Why should I let it go? I'm not letting it go inside. Yeah. Let it go outside. I'm letting it go. We have a conversation. And this, this, and that. Cuddle. Tomorrow's another day. Mm. Tomorrow's another day. And I get over it myself because it yeah. is, it's not a big deal. Right. So forgiveness is, is something you've kept. Yeah. Um, that, and, that and structure. And structure. What about something you've modified? Well. What have you modified? The elephant in the room is, is discipline. Yes. So I grew up in a traditional West Indian background. You hit first and mm. off later. So, and I was occasionally, more, more, you know, occasionally hitting anger. Yeah. And that's something I didn't ever want to mm. sort of raise my hand to my child and then to do this. Mm. They raised their hands in defense. And I, I didn't want to be, my children ever to be scared of me. Yeah. Fearful of me, of my of my wrath, but not of the violence. Yeah. So I would never strike my children. Yeah. I often want to. Yes. I can feel it in the back of my hand sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I and, and there are times I want to shake their heads off. Mm. But you I just can't I can't not with these boys. Yeah. Not in principle. Yeah. Strike another individual, yeah. adult or child, yeah. whatever I think about. Mm. And for me to strike the person I love the most in the world, mm. my wife, yeah. and then my, my children would be ridiculous. Mm. I don't want my child to be scared of me. Yeah. And to cause them harm would be inappropriate. Yeah. So I know the time they're going to go away, I'll just have to let that go. Right. So, no, that will never happen. Did you adopt before you were married? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, so how's that? Um, how have you guys, um, your parenting, I, it's, I imagine it's changed somewhat. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 we were, I mean, I brought up kids as my child all the time. So I, knew, I knew what boys and girls were like, it was yeah. fine. Um, but you go from being a couple with money and Free life, and everything was good. Yeah. You did a couple of years of mucking around doing classes and you know, playing games and stuff and playing with children, that's all fine. And then this thing, this parcel arrives in your front door and that's your child. And 
everything stops and the whole world changes. Mm. And you have no idea. You yeah. have no idea. And these are not regular kids, I'm told. They've got Chinese children. I wouldn't know these are Mexicans. I don't, I don't they just I don't know. It's just how it is. Yeah. And there's things like, do I love them? Do they love me? Can I integrate myself into that? How do I fix, change my life with them? Yeah. What do I do for this person I don't know? Yeah. Since somebody I've been thinking about it for nine months, I've been growing my mind. It's someone I just met. Yeah. I should see him when I see him on a see him on a file, see the picture, I met them mm. once, and now this is my son. Mm. So that's a big change. It's a huge and it's a, it's a sudden change. Um, but I'm lucky. Love hit with me straight away. Yeah. Fell in love with the boys straight away. It was never a problem. Never, never felt anything other than that. And but doing around and because of that, I think doing the things for them became a natural thing to do. Mm. So you know, I don't mind carrying. I don't mind doing stuff. I don't take out the mess. That's what that's what that's what parents, regular parents do. Yeah. But learning to have a different structure, having been independent for a long time in my life, mm. like we're partly independent as well. To have to be dependent on these two children and their wishes, it's a huge thing. Changing your occupation, changing yeah. where you live, changing how you live, changing what you do. Big difference, but done gladly mm. and willingly because they are such fantastic boys and because we have a family yeah. around it. And it's brilliant. Excellent. And um what would you what advice would you give to any parents out there who are considering adoption and you know what what what, what did you find? I mean I've heard about I've heard I mean I don't know a load about it, mm. all right, so I'm not gonna profess that I do, but I do know I've heard stories about parents who wanted to foster or or um, adopt around the whole assessment process and yeah. it being very intrusive and sometimes people talk about it in a, in a traumatic way. What would you say to anyone I, I who's considering? I wouldn't wish the system period on my worst enemy. Right. They go into everything. They go into your financials, your social background, your parent, what you do for a living there. It's incredibly intrusive. They ask about your relationships. They ask everything about you mm. and it takes a long time, a couple of years. Right. And it's really draining. A lot of people give up because it's just too much. It's just too much hassle. It's just too much in your life. But if you get it right, I think you end up with the most wonderful thing, which is a family. And um, I didn't. I didn't do it for. I did it for selfish reasons. I wanted to have a child. I mean, with, with the woman I worked with, with. and we had this beautiful little boy who needed parents, we needed to be parents to him, and it was great, and it's great. We found our family to have two boys, and we are very happy. Um, I would say to somebody who wants to think about adoption, think very hard about it. Be sure you're in the right place emotionally, mm -hmm. okay, because it's a huge change. Yeah. You're not taking a regular kid. Yeah. When you read these stories about these children, yeah. you'll see these children have had very difficult shots in life, yeah. and they are up for adoption because they, can have, they have no support in their family. Yeah. Yeah. And they look to you for security mm -hmm. and support and for comfort. Yeah, I, I guess I never really thought about it in the sense of that no matter what the story is, you're dealing with a child whose attachment has been ripped apart and yeah. gone. And, and so it doesn't even matter what the background is. There's some trauma there. Yeah, it doesn't. You don't have to determine what the trauma no, is. We know there's some form of trauma involved. And there's a lot of therapeutic parenting going on there, and I think I think that that in some ways it sounds ridiculous. Bringing up my boy to help heal me. And mm. what parenting meant to me, what father meant to yeah. me, because because being there for my sons and understanding what that and doing the stuff that dads do, yeah, and not being the thing my father was, is then a better person. Yeah, don't get me wrong, my father was not a bad man. No, he was yeah. not an evil person. He was not a monster. Yeah, he was a man of his time and did what he did. Yeah. But that is not who I am. Yeah. And that's not the kind of person I wanted to be. Mm. And these boys would not live in that environment. Yeah. And for me, okay, to have these young men growing up in my family, be it being my children with my wife, yeah. is a brilliant thing. It's made me much happier, much more balanced, much more responsible, much more reflective. Yeah. And I think I think I'm a kinder person than I was before. So I'm very career. Orientated. Very about me. Focus, what, yeah. I'm going to do this. Yeah. And you guys can all spin. So I'm sort of like, this is my path. Mm -hmm. And now it's okay. Yeah. This is what I want to do. So I love to do it. But how am I going to how to integrate into my life as my family? Yeah. Can I deliver this and still be the person I need to be at home? Because mm. I want to have a balance now. There was no balance before. Now it's about, no, no, it's half o'clock. It's half past four. 
this is going to wrap up the day at five, and I'm out here because I've, I've got to pick up my kids. Yeah, with so, before you'd be willing to stay. Well, I would, I would stay forever, but I've got to, but I want, but the desire to parent my children and be in my family sure. is stronger than the desire yeah. to sit at home. And sit yeah, my and just to pick up on, you know, the fact you said it twice that you, your dad was a, a, a man of his time. I think it's important for us to reflect on the journey of our parents um, and their experiences. Because um, I think often I've seen and heard, you know, people not having the nicest things to say about their parents who may have fell short. But I always kind of say, look, think about their upbringing, think Absolutely. about the time they were brought up in, Absolutely. think about their own experience of being parented. I mean, we think about your dad. Yeah. What was his dad like? Oh, his dad was Do you know what I mean? That was a it's, monster. So, so, so it, it, in real terms, you, you, he probably did a great job so I think, you know, in comparison. I, I think about, you know, I think about, so think about my dad, I really remember, okay, his, 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 his dad was a very, very strong one man. He had very little time for this. And he had very little love from that man. Mm. And my dad tried, you know. I've got really positive memories of my dad. Yeah. He took, took me to the Oval to watch cricket mm. when I was 10 years old, watching the West Indians playing there, in the crowd with the horns mm. and the noise and the music and the noise and the food. All that was brilliant. Yeah. And that was him. He was saying, This is my boy, beat my boy, you know. And I knew, yeah. every knew I was his son. Even though he's feeling like I knew, every knew I was his son. I yeah. don't, don't get me wrong, he was not, he was proud of me. Mm -hmm. But you couldn't tell me that. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you know, and and when you get older, you contextualise. Okay, you you put it you put it into its proper place. And often, when you're younger, you're bitter and resentful because it wasn't like it says in the books. It isn't like he got this and he got that. And yeah. That. But yeah. that isn't the way I was brought up. And I know that my kids would look as I was failing them as a parent because I didn't do this that, and the other. They would do things differently to me, and that's fine. Yeah. All right. But I'm learning on the way, like everybody else yes, is. I'm doing exactly. the, best, the best I can do. And for me, it's really important, you know, that, like I said, you can go around carrying your background and blaming your, your lifestyle and your parents and what the circumstances were. But you know what? My mum and my dad loved me. My mum and dad did the best they could in the circumstances, okay? And look, I can't compare what's turned out. Yeah. I'm a happy, prosperous individual. It's somebody I love, and children I love, yeah. doing a job that I love, and I'm very, very happy. And they did enough. They did more than enough, you know. Mm. And, and, and it's not about adequate parent. Do you feel, do you, and I, the way I feel about my mum, Yeah. I love her, mm. absolutely. I'm yeah. hugely respectful of her, what she did, and, you know, and, and she lives in Jamaica, in a nice house, living her life, and she's and she sacrificed, essentially, if I, everything as far as I could see. And you, and you know, you appreciate what she gave up. Yes. To put me through school. Mm. Who, would, who would you know would work three jobs to do that? To do that. Yeah. yeah. And that's and I think you know when you put that out there. Yeah. All these things melt to one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Important. Okay, so you become a uh, a surgeon. Is that? Did you go straight into being a surgeon? Is that what? Happened? So, I saw, I saw, so again, again, I'm not very good at sort of planning my life. Mm. So medical school flirted, but I was enjoying myself, party, 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 yeah. this stuff. Come to my exams, get honours in surgery. Don't know what that means. Follow the surgical line for a while. Not really enjoying it. Not really focusing on it. Getting by, and then at some point, you know, in my late twenties, early thirties, I was taking time away from medical. Sit down again. Have a talk with myself. What do you want to do? What do you want to be? Yeah. So just what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it because it's hard. I'm going to do it because it's technical. It's easy to get you fix things. So back to being Scotty on the start of Enterprise. Mm. And I go for it. Okay. And again, I meet challenges, which I get through. And I'm very much the recipient of fantastic mentorship. Not about my ethnicity, not about my background, but because I'm driven, because I work hard, and because I've done it the same day twice. So I meet people in there in my career who are prepared to support me. Right. And put, go on them on me. Because right, I get into training, I get into scripts here and there. And it's brought me into a career in surgery, into consultancy, which I take on board. And I give me the opportunity. And at last, I feel I can go with it. And then I go with it. And I go as hard as I can. Mm -hmm. And it's been a brilliant road. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think that if you mapped my progression compared to my colleagues, I, I'm a sort of late bloomer. Mm. And I've struggled along for long periods of time, but the journeys have enriched me. I'm not embittered by it. A lot of the stuff that happened to me is made of my own 
religion, yeah. what I've done, because I, I have chosen to, to, to enable gays and to hold back when I could have just gone for it. Mm. And I was insecure, insecurity um, about doing stuff. But actually recognising in myself that I've got opportunity to do stuff and being supportive, making those decisions, and then finally coming good with it. And again, being forgiven for previous errors by lots of people. Yeah. Finally coming to the career I want to do and finding this career that I want to do, this very weird job that I do. As a, even as a surgeon, it's an odd job. Tell, I tell us about that. Tell us what you do on a day-to-day basis. Tell so, us about that. So, yeah. So, basically, a plumber. <laughs> with less good rates. So most of my, my day job is vascular surgery. I plan and I do archery and vein surgery um, on, on adults. And I do that day in, day out. That's my day job. But I trauma. So I'm privileged enough to work in a major trauma centre in London, out of Royal London, um, where I work as a trauma surgeon. And one week out of six, I do trauma surgery where I run the, the day-to-day running the trauma service where I operate on bits of the trauma. And I've been privileged enough to become the leader for the service. Trauma service, lead for the trauma surgery department. So I, I work underneath the clinical director at Weaver, um, and I'm a, I'm the lead for trauma surgery, and I help deliver that surgical care for those people in our, in our, our trauma centre. So my interests are in that, and I do when I do call, um, I look after victims of injury, both demonstrating and blunt, and uh, provide surgical support, counsel, and delivery and training for that. Listen. So, trauma. 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 What What are you seeing in trauma? So, the most trauma I see is blunt traumas, collisions, falls from height, that kind of stuff. But I live in I live in North East London. Mm-hmm. I work in the busiest centre for penetrating trauma in Western Europe. Okay. In yeah. Western Europe? No one sees more stabbing and shootings than we do. Over our London. So nobody sees more stabbings and shootings than that. And we work at Royal London, and it's a busy trauma centre. We'll, we'll admit a couple of stabbings a day. We'll admit a couple of shootings a week. That's what we do. Okay. And uh, we have unrivaled expertise in management of penetrating trauma. And we train the military. We train civilians. We train everybody. We're the only centre in the country that trains for major trauma. And how do you become the le- one of the leading surgeons? Mm-hmm. Tell me, how does that work? Is, think, is, is, is that because your mortality rate is, no, is low? No, I think you just fall, <laughs> yeah. in, you fall into a role. I mean, I work in a small group. I work in a small field. Yeah. Okay? And I think that and people, as time goes by, you get, you get better at what you do. Do you need steady hands in this world? Can you see my hands? I'm always shaking. <laughs> um, I do. I, um, I've been superbly well trained by really exceptional people who, who, who mentored me really well. And I've got a lot of practice. Mm. I do a lot of work. I work with good people, so you get better. And as time goes by, you, you become the oldest tree in the forest, don't you? The one that mm. disappear. So naturally, you progress. Right. And for me, it's progression. You know, I'm getting better at the and I make, I make less mistakes every week. You know, and I'm, I, 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 I'm more reflective, I'm a better trainer, better, more collaborative person, and I do better work. So I work with exceptional clinicians and these analysts, critical care doctors, emergency department doctors, mm-hmm. doing the best work on sickest people. So that's why, I, that's, why I'm, that's why I'm where I am. It's not anything more about, it's not about talent, it's about people who work around. What would be one of the worst things you've seen in your work? Sorry to bring you back to that. It's difficult, it's difficult. We see a lot of really um, horrible and pointless injuries. I, I, I can deal with the physical injuries, that's what I do. What I can't deal with is the madness behind it. Mm. When I see young people being harmed for no good reason, it upsets me. When I see, when I see the indifference of parents about their children's injury, right, it upsets me because it's not the one thing I could never do. Yeah. Not care. Because I, I mean, I remember when we had the launch of the VCP, you were late. Yeah. And it stood out for me. I remember tweet. I, t- I tweeted a picture of us that I took together on the night and it, you know, I stated that you were late because you were you you had said that someone had come in with a samurai sword. Yeah, I think it was samurai sword injury yeah. or sword injury. Yeah. But you you had to. Um, That's what I do. Yeah, and I think you know the injuries are gory. I've seen I've seen awful things. I've seen people. I think people had awful things done to them by awful people. Mm. And 
that is just something I do. That's just a technical exercise. But what gets to me, and that doesn't get to me. It's not, it's not, it's, that's not, yeah. That, it's, the, it's the emotional compartment of it and that makes me struggle sometimes. Mm. It's about people who, young, vulnerable individuals who hurt other young, vulnerable individuals yeah. and no one seems to care about them. Mm. And when I when I started working in trauma, what I was most surprised by was how the young people were allowed to go back into the community and commit more offences or be harmed again. Yeah. No support around it. And I really it's were astronomical. So I determined I was determined to change that. Yeah. So part of what I do was help set up a service that looks after victims of injury mm-hmm. and supports these kids socially and integrate social care into healthcare to reduce retaliation rates. And that's one of the first of its kind, or, or the first of so, its kind. So I went to America and did some research there, did some work there. Yeah. Um, I learned a lot of great stuff from Michelle Dicker and the team in San Francisco and uh, Oakland. I brought that back and with, with St. Giles Trust set up the first ward-based inter- intervention service in the UK, which has yielded amazing results. And tell us more about what, what that looks like. So you, I've, I've, I've come in, a young yep. a young man, been, I've been shot. Yep. Um, you've you've done what you need to do. Yeah. The easy side of it, technical bits all done. <laughs> you've done all the technical then, bit. And then, and what then, next? So, what and, used to happen? And on a normal yeah, on a normal day, you, you send me home, right? In the old days, you just say congratulations, well done. But you wake up in our ward now, yeah. Okay, and I'll say right, we're good. It's all good. Fair enough. Technical bits done. Right. Meet Rashi. Meet Antonio. Meet Levine. Meet Sam. Meet one of our caseworkers, and they'll say to you, "How can we help?" And the offer is simple. Yeah. It's practical help. Mm-hmm. Do, you want a, do you want a SIM card? Do you want a phone back? Do you want a charger? Yeah. Do you want some food? Do you want to know where you, mum know where you are? In my work, we call that quick wins. I think I think it's about deliverables. And we yeah. recognise that a lot of the people we look after have not been served well mm-hmm. by other bodies. Yeah. So giving the things we actually deliver on is important. And then our caseworkers, who are independent of healthcare, they're not doctors and nurses, right. they're not law enforcement, they've got some mandatory reporting rights, but they, look, they work for you. Right. They work for you and for your family. Right. They will put themselves at your, at your disposal and they will provide support here. They do a need assessment of what you need. Okay. They'll provide support around that. And if that's education, training, etc. And that work starts in the hospital ward, mm-hmm. but continues to home. So we'll go home with you. We'll go present you a call. We'll present stuff to you for, for housing. We'll get you repatriated. We'll bring you back home to your family, get your family talking. We'll get you into employment education if you want to, that's what we would do, and we'll see how things go. And that help extends out for up to six months. Right. Because so it's, it's it's a consistent nurturing relationship with an individual who you can recognise. And our case workers are not, they're not psychologists, they're not they're not psychiatrists, they're not police, they're not ex social workers, they are people who live your life. Yeah. So our, our guys come from right, locally, yeah. Londoners. Mm-hmm. They can they represent our our, our two case workers, our first case workers look like you know, young, late 30s, early 40s, yeah. females from mm-hmm. South East London, didn't take any crap from any of these boys, and bawled them out, and they were they were completely credible mm-hmm. and completely understanding. So they are culturally relevant, they're culturally credible. Okay, not not all black, not all white, not all anything, not all men, not all women, most of us are female. And they listen. But in touch. They're in touch. But they're not so much, they're in touch with you, and they can see into your soul. And when you're alive, they'll tell you you're alive. Mm-hmm. But they will deliver something to you if you ask them to, and they're consistent. Yeah. So, not for the first time, but for, for a significant period of time, these guys will actually always have somebody they can talk to. And I've seen my caseworkers, okay, my caseworkers, the caseworkers, on the phone, bawling out a boy for half an hour for missing an appointment, and telling him, calling him all sorts down the phone. But he never put the phone down. Yeah. He took it for half an hour. From a virtual stranger, because she was on his side. Are they replacing the parent in a way, or I what th- we would want? Would what we'd want from a parent? I think they're supporting uh, the, the formation of parental bond. A lot of time, the families are fractured for lots of reasons, lots of yeah. good reasons. And you've got this young boy who's been acting a certain way, mm. all right. And often, through their own, they find some in a difficult situation. The relationship between that between the parents and the, in that parental group struggles. This boy is doing stuff that you can't control. 14 year boys are out. You can't, can't, you can't bring him back. Yeah. And he's, he's got the attitude of a 14 year old growing up in North East London, and his attitudes are different and counter to yours. You might have the skills, like my skills I have. Yeah. No yeah, skills. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you might have the skills to, to listen and understand. You might, you might, you might use what you would do when you were a kid, and that ain't going to work with these kids nowadays. No. 
So that's the other one there. Yeah. And you lose faith in each other. Yeah. So we start bringing that back together because we, we recognise that we can't do all the work. We need to create, you know, a nurture environment in our home. Mm. And when we've got the, 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 the parents and children and the whole family group talking to each other and listening to each other, you back away because that's, the, that's, a, that's, a, that's a supportive relationship. Yeah. And, and who's funding this? So we're partly funded by the mayor's office, yeah. partly funded by charity donation. Um, and I, I fund it myself a little bit as well. Do you fund some of it yourself? Fundraise, fundraise. Oh, fundraise, sorry. Not, if I had money, man, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be, in, I'd be, in, I'd be in the beach somewhere. Yeah. Um, and it's, but, but because the results are so spectacular, it's gone to support. And actually, we're brilliantly fortunate that Tower Hamlets have actually brought caseworkers of their own to work within our service as well. Mm-hmm. And then we're starting to work in the emergency department as well. So we'll be having, we'll be having coverage for emergency department, for our wards, for victims of domestic abuse. We'll all be supported in that service. And we, what I always want to do is integrate social care with healthcare at, at the point of an entry. So you get seen by our team when you arrive and you can't go home until anybody's happy. Right. And statistically, this has been shown to have... Reduced your admissions to 1% under our right way offending, right way offending and, 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 and right way admissions down to 1%, but it was at the highest 35% of our service. So 1%? Yeah. Of your of your of those people that are coming for those type of injuries Come are back. coming back. Yeah. And it was what before? Thirty five. Yeah. It was bad. But you see you see you we have kids come back in kids come back in with their still with their hospital tagged on. That but quick. They're still fired up. <laughs> because they had to have their own business. You know how yeah. things are. Yeah. 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 You push on me, man, I don't know who you are. I'm not gonna go to the police. No. This is my business and I'm gonna handle it. Mm. Wow. Okay. Well that's one thing you're doing. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to be back with um, some final words in terms of um, some other stuff uh, with regards to the trust um, and the VCTB as well. Brilliant. Have you been wrongfully denied access to your child and don't know what to do or who to talk to? On average, family solicitors charge £250 per hour. However, at Father Figure Children and Family Services, we offer free consultation and a service with a real personal feel at just a fraction of that price. We provide telephone meetings, complete paperwork, accompany you to court, negotiate with the respondent's solicitor. But what makes us really stand out is the coaching and support we provide to our clients. Visit www.fatherfigure.org.uk and book yourself a free consultation now. Okay, so we are back after that short break and we are in our final segment of the Fathers Matter 2 podcast and uh, we're speaking to Martin Griffith, uh, vascular trauma surgeon, um, leading vascular trauma surgeon. We've spoken about his upbringing, his life and um, being um, a surgeon and you know what he's doing, the great work he's doing, which is a little bit different to just sewing him up and sending him home. Um, tell me a little bit about the... Um, the Mary Seacole Trust, which um, you're involved in. Mary Seacole Trust is an absolutely brilliant, brilliant endeavour, which I'm very privileged to be an ambassador for. I was proud Trevor Sterling, the chair. Um, Mary Seacole Trust um, celebrates um, the achievements of Mary Seacole, a um, Jamaican nurse who was at, um, active in the Crimea, who was, was um, forgotten, I think, at yeah. the time. Mm. And then we discovered. Uh, relatively recently, and she, alongside Florence Nightingale, a lot of wonderful women, provided great care to the soldiers in her time, and was was rightly celebrated in her uh, in her time. But I think lost to history too recently. And I think what we'd be evaluating is we'd be put her in context. And the Mercy Gold Charity initially was formed to um, uh, put a statue of her on the river, where it's in the Thomas' Hospital, but it's now moved on to explore supporting. Um, diversity in healthcare, primarily in the mm. war endeavours, and I think it's to celebrate Mary's legacy, to try and promote that um, aspiration of delivering things despite or respective of your diversity, yeah. and to promoting um, those careers and those experiences in healthcare and other, and other endeavours. Yeah, and I think you know, I think it's actually fantastic, Jerry. And um, in terms of diversity, people yeah. of colour being in. Um, um, the field that you're in, do you do you see that it's, you know, we don't see as much representation of, of black people 
so the numbers are pretty stark. There are lots and lots of diversity in NHS in terms of level up, working at lower levels. Mm-hmm. But in the high levels of management representation, there is a stark disproportionality. And uh, numbers of leaders in healthcare do not represent the ethnic diversity of people who work at lower levels. Mm. So there's some sort of an institutional issue that needs to be addressed. And it has been picked up by the uh, race picked up by the government, picked up by the NHS itself, and they, and they are working towards that. But it does strike you. Yeah. When I go into a room, I look around as a seat member of staff, it's me. Mm. That's what I've been going through all my life. It's not a new thing for me. No. But I would have hoped that we would tackle this earlier. And I think that we look at we look at representation of women in medicine, representation of diversity, be it be it gender or sexuality, there is a bias. Mm. That is unconscious, it's, it's unconscious, but exists in the institution. We have to challenge that because the NHS is the best thing about the UK, mm. the best thing about what we are, and it, it represents the best of our desires to provide healthcare to people. Yeah. And it should represent the population that it serves, it should represent diversity within, because diversity gives you better choices and better discussions and better healthcare. Yeah, yeah. And I think if you listen to the more voices you listen to, the better ideas you have. And if we're an open, Moving forward, culture, we've got to take that on board, and we've got yeah. to do that thing. And, 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 and it cuts both ways. Mm. Okay, it's about being good enough, yeah, rather than being, being in a certain box, yes. Okay, but it's about having the skills to do that and understanding for me, okay, as somebody who has a sort of label in a lot of my issues are related to myself and my, and my unwillingness to accept challenge or my unwillingness to believe I was good enough to do sort of stuff. Have I been mentored differently in early life? Have I become, achieved more early in my life? Mm. Um, it's about recognising talent. It's about us understanding what diversity looks like. It's about, more importantly, not about forgiving ourselves for past mistakes. These are not my mistakes, these are not your mistakes, these are things that happened institutionally in the past. Mm. Let's forgive ourselves for what happened and let's move forward yeah. because there's a better way. Yeah. People are fearful of diversity, so they go through official mechanisms of delivering, delivering and challenge. So people get disciplined because yeah. so they're a different colour. Mm-hmm. Different gender rather than being spoken to yeah. in a friendly manner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that creates distrust. Yeah. And I think that what I really want to see is an open culture where the best people get a, get less opportunity. The people who aren't strong get supported. Yeah. And if you make mistakes you get you get you get supported. Yeah. And I think that what I'm what I'm massively keen on the things like the basic trust is they recognise that that dilemma and they and they and they approach it in an evolutionary supportive, consistent way. Mm. Because this problem will not be fixed by people wailing at it on the outside. No, it's it'll be fixed it. by people who enter into the system, work within that system, understand its, understand its vulnerabilities and its strengths, and change it. Mm. And we change it fundamentally by making it a more caring understanding environment. And we're going to help this country get better yeah. by promoting, by seeing what we are. We are what the black community members about. And as a, as a parent, as an individual, as a healthcare worker, as a black man, I want to do all those things at the same time. Yeah. And I want to learn from all of my colleagues, all my female colleagues, all my colleagues of different gender and sexuality. Yeah. I want to find out how things are so I can be better at what I want to do. I want to understand that. And if you all do that, yeah. we will get better. And, then, and, is, and is the problem two tiered? Are there enough people of colour, black people, getting into the medical field, firstly? Do you feel like there's enough? Do you think there could be more? I hope there could be more. Yeah. When I, looked, so when, when, I, when I went through in the eighties, I thought I would have. I would thought I was the first of a big sort of wave coming. Of coming yeah. And looking around, I see well, there's a couple of people here and there, but it's not what I expected to see. Yeah. So, so they why, could. Why, why are you not choosing medicine as a career? Why are you not coming through? I don't know. Ask those questions. I I sit on four with um, um, black medical students and black, black clinicians, mm. uh, junior clinicians, and I, and I and I talk with them about this, the same issue. And we're at a loss. Is it, do you think it, because I mean, similar to yourself, it wasn't, it wasn't your first choice. No. And so is it that it's, it's generally, it's not a first choice anyway. Uh, some, I mean, some people are going to naturally have that, that want and desire to maybe get into a medical field, but it's just not a first choice. Is visibility. it hot? Visibility. Yeah, this saw, is it. I never saw that from, you know, it wasn't African or from mm. someone from America. It yeah. It made no sense to me. Yeah. So when I go to my, from our primary school, mm. I did a talk and said like, hey, I'm the head of the doctor, look here in a minute, whoa. Yeah, yeah, excellent. You're the boss? I'm like, yeah. Yeah. I go on the wards, go around, go around with my team. Yeah. Onto the trauma ward. They go, what is this guy walking around the yeah. end space? He's the boss. I go, what? Yeah. 
They need to be able to touch it and see it, I guess. Well, I, think, you know, I, think, I think for everybody, you know, yeah. it's got to be tangible. I think. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I think, you know, people don't believe this talk of this mysterious mm. unicorn floating around mm. with wings. They meet one. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, I'm a real person with a real career and a real job and I do real work. And I'm not there because I'm black. Mm. They're because I'm good at what I do. Exactly. And I think that's important to appreciate for everybody concerned. Yeah. I don't credential myself in this too. That's yeah. I am very proud. Yeah. Of my Jamaican heritage. I'm very proud of who I am. Mm. All right. I don't I don't consider that a burden or a disability. I consider that to be something to be proud about. Yeah. But by the same token, I'm not there because I'm this person. No. Some of my drivers relate to my background, okay, in my opinion. But I'm more interested in poor people than mm. to black people. And I'm not going to beat someone over the head yeah. because they're not black. Yeah. About the way things are. Yeah. I, mean, I want us all to understand that we have all got value to offer. Mm. And you know, and just exploit exploit that that willingness to change. And what would you say to maybe some of the staff that are already in NHS or, you know, with working uh, and maybe, you know, they're feeling like there might be a glass ceiling or whatever. What would you say to them? I say that if I can do it, mm. why can't you? Yeah. Because I'm right here. Yeah. If you want to talk to me, let's talk to me. Come right. come to the office, the door's always open. Let's talk about what the issues are. Yeah. And let's try and see where your feelings from, where it's coming from. Mm. I know the institution that I work in, there's no desire to keep perpetuate that situation. Right. We're actively looking to try and make sure that everybody does their best. Yeah. Everybody's the best they can be. Mm. And I think that, you know, you've got to understand yourself. Say to yourself, well, you know, I feel this about this stuff. I feel this. Is it a real thing? Is it is it is it my perception? Is it yeah. the truth? But look around, and if I can see success, and I can I can identify individuals who are doing these great things, then I will be part of that. I'm mm. part of that journey. And I'm not going to lie to you, my journey has been longer than some. Yeah. And it's been harder than some. Yeah. And it's felt at times there was nowhere to go. I felt there's just been black all around me. There's nowhere to go. I've just been at sea, with no anchoring point, with my career going nowhere. I think it's going with no, I was going to fail. But even at those darkest times, even someone put their hand out for me, and they weren't all black, mm. they weren't all men. Yeah. Right. And I look back now, and I'm grateful for every single person who helped me. Yeah. Even the ones who said I couldn't do it, they gave me. They the gave me that. Yeah. Push it forward, mm. and I absolutely, absolutely know. All right, I'm here on merit, not on favour. Mm. So that, I don't feel worried about that. Yeah. Excellent. All right, so let's let's um, end it by talking about the BCPB, Violent Crime Prevention Board, which is where we've um, crossed paths. Absolutely. Um, you were invited onto the board by. Well, a combination of Angela and, and, and Dr. Dr. Lawrence. Dr. Lawrence, yeah. The great Dr. Lawrence. Mm -hmm. um, and I was incredibly impressed um, by him as an individual, mm -hmm. by his the, the way he carries himself, his dignity. Yeah. And uh, the way he approaches what was a horrible thing that happened to him and his family, and his ability to forgive, yeah, and yeah. want to change things in a, in a positive way, to move towards positivity rather than to rather than to, to renege against them and constantly reflect back on the bad 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 aspects of it. Mm -hmm. BCPB, as you know, works to promote positivity, yeah, if not understand it and to promote diversity and to, and to understand the drivers behind violence in the communities that we were a part of and to find a better solution and to promote aspiration okay, and to help delivery. Mm -hmm. I think we work with all the bodies around to try and deliver that. It's a huge troubling times yeah. in London. Mm -hmm. One to a spite in some regards in the recent past and we're being challenged to understand why it is that children are being murdered on the streets of a city that's not we need to understand yeah. why it is that in the black community it seems to be okay for children to be murdered. And the first response is to blame the child. And that's our challenge. Yeah. That's challenging the black community to understand itself mm. and to make a difference. Yeah. And I think it is important that as a community we do accept that we have a, a set of because you know you do hear that well people get murdered in Liverpool and they're not black they're not always black or they get murdered in other parts of the country and they're not necessarily black but we have an issue that is specific to this us that we have to we have to address. You can put all the numbers to one side and say it's all about poverty. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Mm. But come to the ward with me and see who I'm seeing. All right. Yeah. 
and tell me. What would you say? What would you say the percentage of like, I don't the balance? I don't know. I think, I think whatever, it's, it's disproportionate. It's disproportionate, number. regardless of, of numbers. Regardless of numbers, it's, 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 it's well, anybody, excuse yeah. me. And, it, and it's not representative of the of the numbers of black people living in London. No, or representative of the people who I know yeah. black in London. So this is it. It's not It's not that everybody I know in black is some sort of, sort of gang member. Or criminal. Yeah, of course. It's, there are the vast majority of people I know in London are law abiding, public, and what Exactly. So, so we're now dealing with an even smaller yeah. percentage of, of black people in London who are ending up on your ward. Yeah. So and we need to understand what it is about London, about what we do. It's not just London, but what we do, about how that's happened. We need to stop blaming everybody else. The solutions will not come from the police. It will not come from social services, it will not come from education, it will not come from the government. It will come from the person next to you mm-hmm. who says to you, Martin, why are you doing that? Martin, talk to me about this. Yeah. Martin, where are you going to? And that's not parental, that's community. And communities that support each other, understand each other, who challenge behavior and attitudes are healthy places. Mm-hmm. We've got to ask ourselves why are so many people are poor or why they're in London? Why aren't these kids leaving at school? Why aren't these kids trying to do things more than us? Why are they fold into sport or music yeah. rather than academia? Yeah. Why are we not producing the scientists and the, and the engineers and the lawmakers and the clinicians that we should be producing in our communities? These kids are there. Yeah. Why are we not supporting their aspiration? Yeah. And why are our palms up looking for help? Mm. We should be putting our palmers down and pushing up ourselves mm. because that's what's got to have to happen. Yeah. And why does all the talent leave? First chance you get, you're out. Gone. We've got to build strong units. Yeah, and I guess that's why it's important for someone like you to be here um, or be in the kitchen talking about this stuff because I think all too often the people who make it, we just don't see them. We don't hear from them, they're not visible. Um, and we need to make sure that we, we are visible you are visible and, and people are, are able to actually touch and, and say that, look, I can, I can do that. Well, you must. I think the, 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 the biggest tragedy of youth is individuals who felt like their attention mm. because they don't think they can do it. Yeah. And if you, as a friend or a parent or an associate, are complicit in that failure, you should be ashamed. Yeah. Martin Griffith? Thank you very much. We will go on to eat dinner now. Damn right. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Good to see you. Thank you for listening to the Father's Matter 2 podcast with your host, David Mullings. Sponsored by Port Royal Paddies and Father Figure Children and Family Services. Keep checking in as we will be regularly releasing new episodes. Fathers matter too.